My name's Nick Pope. I'm a serving official with the British Ministry of Defence, which I joined in 1985. I've done a number of different tours of duty there, the most relevant of which is from 1991 to 1994, when I was posted to a division called Secretariat Air Staff, and my duties there were to research and investigate the UFO phenomenon for the British government. I received somewhere between two and three hundred UFO reports each year and my job was to evaluate these to come to a decision about whether there was evidence of any threat to the defence of the United Kingdom. Now after an in-depth investigation, 90 to 95 percent of those sightings turned out to have prosaic explanations. But we were left with a hard core of sightings which uh, defied any conventional explanation whatsoever and these were a, a bunch of interesting cases involving uh, sightings by military personnel, uh, near misses between UFOs and aircraft, instances where UFOs were tracked on radar and cases where UFOs were um, captured on film and video. Over the years in which the British government has uh, been looking at the UFO phenomenon there have been numerous cases on which uncorrelated targets have been tracked by military fighter controllers and certainly on a number of those occasions military jets were either diverted from task or indeed scrambled to try and intercept these objects not to engage them in any hostile sense but merely to uh, close with them to identify them now on those occasions I have to say um, we have not been successful in our attempts to, to make an interception, invariably we find that the speeds and manoeuvres of the UFOs are way ahead of uh, the best things in our inventory with regard to aircraft. So they, they run rings around us, frankly. On occasion, when military jets have actually been chasing UFOs to try and uh, maybe get gun camera footage uh, or to try and close within uh, visual range to get an ID on, on what the, uh, the mystery craft is. Uh, these things have shown not only are they capable of phenomenal bursts of speed but also the capacity to just stop and turn in an instant, um, raising all sorts of issues about the, the G-force um, implicit in such a manoeuvre. G-forces which frankly even with the, the best G-suit um, would uh, be far too much I think for any uh, human to survive so that in itself raises interesting questions about uh, who's operating these things. To pick a few cases to talk about which are particularly impressive I think one has to perhaps start uh, um, back in 1956, say, with a, a radar visual sighting that took place um, near the Bentwaters area. And on this occasion, and incidentally this was one of the cases uh, written up in Project Blue Book and uh, judged to be particularly significant. Now, to cut a long story short, there were uh, fighter controllers who picked up uh, a radar target which was uh, not readily identifiable as one of our own aircraft. So we simply took a look at that and judged that uh, there was indeed a solid structured craft in the air. It was travelling at a phenomenal speed compared to uh, the uh, envelope as it were of um, our, our own fighters. So jets were launched and indeed the pilots did manage to close and get a visual sighting on uh, this object. They, they just described it I think really as, as some sort of structured possibly disc shaped craft but uh, frankly it was just too fast and maneuverable for them to get a really uh, clear view and again it, it ran rings around them so that was an interesting example, one of many of uh, these craft displaying speeds and maneuvers which we couldn't hope to match. Now to throw in a, an example of a, a much more modern sighting and one that I was directly involved in, in the investigation of, um, on the 30th and 31st of March 1993 
a series of UFO encounters took place over Great Britain, the most interesting of which involved an occasion where two Air Force bases were actually overflown by a large triangular or diamond-shaped UFO. Uh, now, the two establishments um, involved in this are RAF Cosford and RAF Shawbury in the Midlands. At RAF Cosford, the guard patrol, uh, this happened, in fact, this part of the sighting happened in the early hours of the 31st, about 10 past 1 in the morning. Um, the guard patrol at Cosford saw this uh, UFO fly directly over the base. Uh, they, of course, phoned in an immediate report, uh, found, interestingly, there was nothing showing up on radar at all, even though they had this thing going right over their heads. They phoned, amongst other people, their colleagues at RAF Shawbury, which is about 10 or 12 miles um, down the road. And the meteorological officer took the phone call. Now, you have to understand there is only a skeleton staff um, at these establishments. So the Met officer there took the call, went outside, perhaps just thinking really that this was um, perhaps people playing a trick on him. But sure enough, in the distance, he saw a bright light heading his way. This thing got closer and closer. And the way he described it to me, that voice shaking with emotion the following morning, was like a massive, flat, triangular-shaped craft, um, possibly raised a little bit like a diamond passing over his head at a height of maybe no more than 200 feet, slightly to one side, emitting a low-frequency humming sound, which he said that he could not only hear but feel. Intriguingly, this craft was firing a narrow beam of light down at the fields, just beyond the perimeter fence uh, of the military base. And he said that this this object came towards him at a speed of probably no more than 20 or 30 miles an hour, very slow. Suddenly the light retracted up into the craft and in an instant it shot off to the horizon in a matter of seconds. And he said, bear in mind this is a, an Air Force officer with eight years experience in the service. Um, he sees aircraft from fast jets every day of his life. And he said, well, the speed of this thing was probably about uh, ten times the speed of an Air Force jet and uh, when asked, when I asked him uh, to estimate the size of this this mystery craft uh, with typical military precision he said it was probably midway between a C-130 Hercules transport aircraft and a Boeing 747 jumbo jet. Now I launched a full investigation into this uh, incident and in fact this was one of uh, a series of sightings that took place over the entire country on that particular night uh, involving not just members of the public but uh, numerous police officers particularly in the southwest of England and in Wales and also in the Midlands. Now I made all the usual checks, uh, we impounded the radar tapes and had them sent up uh, to Ministry of Defence main building, we checked the radar tapes, at first we thought we might have something but uh, we, we eliminated that out as, as really just uh, anomalous propagation and uh, we made all the series of checks that we could possibly make, uh, checking for everything from satellite tracks and uh, uh, re-entry into the Earth's orbit of, of uh, space debris to astronomical phenomena, meteorites, fireballs, um, satellite tracks, military aircraft exercises, weather balloon launches. However unlikely this was, we checked. That, that was always the philosophy. You check everything in this business. We drew a complete blank and at the end of about a week or so of pretty solid work on this, I put a report up the chain of command through my head of division to the assistant chief of the air staff, um, an air vice marshal. So I, I think, yes, a two-star Air Force officer. We put this up to him and we basically said that an uncorrelated um, target, an unidentified craft, but a you know, not just a light or a shape, a structured craft of unknown origin penetrated what we call the, the UK ADR, that, that's the United Kingdom Air Defence Region 
on that particular night flew without being tracked on radar, without any aircraft being launched, flew with total impunity over two military establishments and over a large part of the rest of the country, and then disappeared. Object unexplained. Um, the assistant chief of the air staff thought long and hard about that, and I suppose it was a catch-22 situation. He simply came back and he said, well, it's a very interesting case, but you've clearly run all the checks that you can make. There is, frankly, nothing more we can do, but um, it's fascinating. Now, I think when that went up the chain of command, and I can't recall, although I suspect it did, uh, whether it went to defence ministers uh, or not, and, and indeed uh, up to Chief of the Defence Staff and Secretary of State for Defence. But I think whatever the nature, and the unsatisfactory nature of the conclusion, um, we certainly changed a few people's minds there about the whole nature of the UFO phenomenon. And we got, I think, a number of senior civil servants and military officers to really realize on their watch, as it were, that this was not just stuff and nonsense, that the UFO phenomenon is not just lights and shapes in the sky. It's, it's real, it's solid, it, it can involve the military as much as anyone else. And I think that that remains one of the most significant cases ever to have taken place in Britain. And, and frankly, it shows uh, if, if indeed there is any doubt remaining, the serious defence and national security issues raised by the whole UFO phenomenon. Over the years there have been a number of uh, uh, films taken by military aircraft through gun cameras. Now unfortunately this film footage, uh, and again I checked, it does not seem to exist anymore. Now interestingly, um, one of my predecessors um, who headed up the division where I worked under its previous title of DS-8, that is Defence Secretariat 8, was a man called Ralph Noyes. And he is someone who, before his death, also, uh, as a, a Ministry of Defence employee, spoke out publicly about the reality of the UFO phenomenon and uh, made the point to all who would listen that there was a serious phenomenon here and it did need and deserve serious study. Now Ralph certainly did see those uh, bits of film footage and Ralph uh, told me and indeed I think he's, uh, um, his testimony has, has gone on to the, the written record as, as well. He did tell me that he was called to a briefing of uh, senior Air Force personnel and that they all gathered around to look at uh, some of this footage that had come after a, uh, a chase where a military jet had been sent up to try and get a closer look at a UFO. And uh, Ralph Noyes told me that uh, he and all these uh, people on the air staff just sat around gasping with astonishment, looking, pointing, wondering, but, but frankly not able to really take it that much further, except again the uh, implicit acknowledgement that there are things operating in our airspace uh, which have better capabilities than we do. And uh, when I say that, of course, I, I include uh, the point about prototype craft, because one of the points that is often uh, put forward about the UFO phenomenon is, is the, uh, I suppose, fairly reasonable uh, question, well, couldn't it be that what you're seeing when you talk about structured craft with high speeds and uh, extraordinary manoeuvres is just the next generation of Air Force air, um, planes, uh, prototype devices, whether they be aircraft or remotely piloted vehicles? Well, speaking as uh, a serving member of the Ministry of Defence and having done the UFO job for three years, I can tell anyone who makes that point that uh, yes of course at any given time there are prototype aircraft and devices that we operate but we know where we operate our own bits of kit. We operate them in very carefully controlled and defined ranges and danger areas and we do not make mistakes about uh, UFOs and prototypes. We don't go chasing UFOs if it's a prototype. We can tell the difference. So when the public sees something 
you know, who knows? It depends where they see it. But uh, when we're talking about military sightings and when we're talking about the research and investigation that I did, if I had stumbled onto a prototype uh, test, then A, I would have known, and B, if I hadn't have known, I would have been told. And of course, we would have uh, butted out of that uh, pretty quick. Britain's most famous UFO case um, is the Rendlesham Forest incident, which is sometimes uh, also referred to as, as the Bentwaters case. Now, that involved a series of UFO incidents over a number of nights in December of 1980, involving the, in fact, they are nominally Royal Air Force bases, but in fact, of course, they were operated by the United States Air Force, uh, RAF, uh, Bentwaters and RAF Woodbridge in Suffolk. Now here there were a series of encounters where some people saw uh, lights in the sky performing extraordinary maneuvers but perhaps much more significantly uh, on the first night of activity um, people saw a structured metallic craft actually moving not not up in the sky but right down pretty much at ground level moving through Rendlesham Forest, which adjoins the two bases. Um, and at one point, this small, metallic, roughly triangular-shaped craft seemed to actually come down and land in a particular clearing. Now, all the witnesses to this um, are military personnel. They're trained observers. Uh, they don't make mistakes. Some of the skeptics have suggested that this could have been a, a mistaken sighting of a nearby lighthouse. That's nonsense for two reasons. Firstly, these were trained military observers who actually were fam familiar with the lighthouse and saw it pretty much uh, every night of their tour of duty. But secondly, at, at, certainly at one point in the encounter, the lighthouse was clearly visible at the same time as the UFO. So this simply could not have been the lighthouse. Uh, as, as the skeptics uh, sometimes suggest. Now I have, uh, although of course this case uh, predated my own tour of duty, um, really by, by 10 years, a little more, um, I reviewed the case and I uh, looked through the file and I tried to reopen the investigation uh, into this incident. The most important thing that I was able to focus on was in fact physical evidence that something had taken place because after this uh, craft had touched down people went back in the light of day to the landing site and found that where they'd seen this craft land there were in fact three triangular uh, indentations in the forest floor. What I mean by that is, is there were three indentations which uh, when you drew lines between them were pretty much in the shape of a perfect equilateral triangle. Now, one of the things that uh, was done was that uh, the area was checked for radiation. And this is where I came in. I took the readings that uh, were taken, and it's important to say these readings peaked in two places. They peaked in the indentations themselves, and also, uh, some damage that was done to the sides of the trees in the clearing as if this thing had uh, come down and, and snapped off some branches and stripped off some bark as it had done so either coming in or going out. Now I t sent the figures that had been recorded at the time by Lieutenant Colonel Charles Holt who was the deputy base commander himself a witness uh, to some of these incidents. I, I sent the data from Holt and his team to the Defence Radiological Protection Service, um, which is part of the Ministry of Defence. And they came back to me and they were frankly bemused by this whole thing and they said that the, uh, the radiations from the indentations in the ground were ten times background for that area, ten times what they, they should have been. Now of course it is important to say that the levels were still comparatively low. Uh, Holt and his team were not endangered by this. This was still low-level radiation. But again, looking at it from a scientific point of view, that's not the point. The point is that when compared with, the, as it were, control readings immediately outside of the area, you had these 
this peak of 10 times normal right where this thing, whatever it was, came down on the forest floor. So that, I think, is extremely significant because it involved not only sightings by trained military observers, and also I, I should mention that at one point uh, this craft was tracked on radar from uh, a nearby base, uh, RAF Watton. So you had sightings on radar, sightings by trained military personnel, and after the event in the cold light of day, the undeniable scientific methodological evidence of the radiation readings. So that, by anyone's standards, has to be an extremely significant event and proof, I think, beyond all question of doubt that there was an unknown craft uh, in that particular clearing on that particular night. And I have seen uh, witness statements from them and I've heard testimony from some of those involved to suggest that uh, much more went on uh, on that particular night than even went into the file uh, that ended up in the Ministry of Defence where it's claimed that UFOs have uh, taken an extreme interest in civilian nuclear power stations, uh, military installations with nuclear assets there. During my tour of duty um, in Secretary and Air Staff at the Ministry of Defence, I operated, I hope, a very open policy with regard to uh, the UFO issue. And I made it my business to uh, be, be quite open and honest about the official research and investigation that I was doing, um, and not to suppress any data on this. I believe that governments and the military and indeed uh, private researchers, politicians, whoever, you know, everything should be in the public domain on this issue. Governments can't, I think, have it both ways. You cannot say on the one hand, uh, as the party line often goes, that UFOs are of no defence significance, and then on the other, uh, keep back some of the data. Y you simply can't do that. You have to have it one way or the other. And if, as governments consistently say, uh, as it were, when the, the, the politicians uh, probe on this issue or when the media inquire, that there's really nothing to worry about, then OK, let's see all the data and let's check that that decision uh, is a valid one uh, reached um, through a proper methodology. Now, I, in support of that aim, uh, believe that there should be a full disclosure of all information on UFOs held by governments all around the world. I think there are some encouraging signs that that's beginning to happen. Um, I know, for example, that early um, in 2000, at a conference uh, in San Marino, which was part sponsored by the Ministry of Tourism there, so it had a, an official uh, flavor to it, the Italian Air Force actually sent a delegation on duty, in uniform, uh, to talk about uh, UFO cases uh, received by the Italian Air Force and Ministry of Defence over the years. Now, I'm also aware that this has happened in Chile, and as I've said, uh, my own um, efforts to try and be very open with this and to push data into the public domain uh, as well, I, I hope, have taken uh, the issue forward somewhat. But yes, I am a supporter of total openness and honesty on this issue. Clearly, it's a very important issue, one which I've made no secret of the fact, I think, raises important defence and national security issues. But these are not issues that should be addressed by a small clique uh, and, and any uh, one grouping of people. These are issues of global significance which should be addressed and debated by everyone. And indeed, we cannot make a full and proper assessment of the, the phenomenal data we have without bringing in all sorts of people, uh, scientists, politicians, military experts, in a much wider way than perhaps this information is available now. I've made no secret of the fact that I believe some of these UFOs may well be of extraterrestrial origin. Now, I know that that's an extraordinary statement for a, a serving officer in the Ministry of Defence to make, 
Um, I don't make it, of course, as an official announcement. It is, of course, me speaking in a private capacity. But it is me speaking on the basis of three years' official research investigation, three years of me looking at new sightings coming in and reviewing the 250 or 300 odd cases, uh, sorry, case files um, of, of me reviewing the 250 or 300 files held by either the Ministry of Defence or the Public Record Office on the UFO issue, some of which were classified secret at the time. So I don't make these statements lightly, and I don't do so on the basis of a blind leap of faith. I do it on the basis of the data held by the government. It's important as well to say, um, I am not alone in this belief that even within the Ministry of Defence in Britain and the Air Force, um, and indeed the political establishment, I am not a lone voice here. The Ministry of Defence is, is not a, a great indivisible um, organisation like anything else. It is a collection of individuals. So when you talk about government, the military and uh, the establishment, whatever uh, grouping you talk about, what you're really talking about is a group of individuals. And I found that there are sceptics and believers um, in the world of officialdom. And there are more believers in an extraterrestrial presence than many might suspect, particularly in the Air Force. Largely, I suspect, because when you actually think about it, a lot of people, and I've tested this myself, I've gone out, I've spoken to people uh, socially and in the margins of meetings and courses and such like. When you go out and speak to the Air Force in Britain, somebody may have had a sighting, somebody may have tracked an uncorrelated target on radar, see it do manoeuvres that we couldn't possibly match. Either somebody has had these experiences themselves or knows of somebody, a friend, a colleague, who's had the same thing. So I'm not saying that there is an acceptance of an extraterrestrial reality, but there is certainly uh, more belief than you might suspect. At the beginning of my tour of duty, I did make some effort to establish a dialogue with opposite numbers, uh, particularly in America. Now, I was uh, given the party line, I guess, that uh, officially the Americans had been out of the UFO investigation game since 1969 when Project Blue Book was closed down. I didn't, frankly, have time to follow that up and probe deeper. How much assistance did your investigations receive from, uh, for example, the NSA facility at Minwith Hill or the National Reconnaissance Office satellite programs that do reconnaissance? Um, uh, did you receive any confirmations from those entities or assistance from those entities? I don't want to talk, I'm afraid, about any uh, liaison with certain agencies on this. All I will say in very general terms is that if I had a, uh, a particularly interesting case on which I felt I needed assistance from any other agency uh, with any other capability or bit of hardware, uh, then I would ask through channels. Um, but uh, really, most of the UFO cases uh, that came my way, I was happy with the assets that I had and you know, really did the day-to-day -day research and investigation using um, national assets such as uh, the UK Air Defence Region uh, radar stations, uh, the Ballistic Missile Early Warning Centre at RAF Filingdales and such like, uh, but I don't want to go much further than that. Suffice to say that there have been a steady stream over the years uh, of good quality cases, which I think would convince any open-minded observer who actually looked at the data uh, that there was something here which went significantly further than, than just uh, lights in the sky and something which, uh, whatever the, the claims that are sometimes made about this phenomenon, uh, suggests that something of extreme defence significance is happening, not just in UK airspace, but indeed, I think, of uh, airspace all around the world. In Britain, at the Public Record Office, at present, there are about 30 UFO files uh, open to the public. Now, in total, 
I believe there are between around about 250 and 300 files, and some of those uh, were classified secret, uh, now of course declassified. Britain will get its Freedom of Information Act shortly, and I hope and believe that most, if not all, uh, of the British government and military UFO files will soon be released. What there is, however, is a body of evidence which, when placed end-to-end -end and looked at by any dispassionate observer uh, with any military or scientific experience, will, I think, constitute proof of the reality of this phenomenon. One important fact about the uh, British wave of sightings in March 1993 was that it happened three years to the very night after the wave of sightings that uh, rocked the establishment in Belgium and led to the scrambling of F-16s. That, again, was late on the 30th and in the early hours of the 31st of March. So it's, it's one of those very interesting uh, facts that perhaps two of Europe's most significant UFO waves actually happened on the very same night of the year three years apart. Now what that means I don't know. Uh, it's certainly significant I think. Uh, one of the things we're taught um, in government is don't believe in coincidences. So there's something there. Perhaps I think it's been suggested um, as a, an indicator of some sort of intelligence behind these craft. One, one theory is that uh, it has to do with media coverage. It's the one night, perhaps, that you can get away with flying so low over military bases um, and so close to the ground over a populated area. And the reason for that is that uh, it will happen too late to be reported in the media on the 31st of March. So if it makes the, uh, the press uh, and the TV news, the story will run on the 1st of April. So that might mean that uh, people will disregard the story and treat it as uh, what we call an April Fool's joke. Although it predated my involvement, one of the most significant uh, waves of sighting in Europe took place over Belgium in uh, March of 1990. And on that occasion, uh, UFOs were seen by large numbers of people on the ground and tracked on radar, resulting in two F-16 fighter interceptors being scrambled. Uh, these aircraft then picked up the UFO uh, themselves on their airborne radar and an intriguing game of cat and mouse played itself out um, in the skies of Belgium over the next hour or so. Now although that happened before I was posted into Secretariat Air Staff, I did simply because I was aware of it and because it was clearly a, a significant case, make contact with the British Air Attaché in Brussels and I asked him really for my own peace of mind and for my own background research to confirm the reality of that and he had certainly spoken directly I believe to one or both of the 16 pilots uh, and to, to the senior military officer involved in this, Colonel de Brouwer um, and certainly the word that came back to me um, officially via our embassy was, yes, this incident happened pretty much as reported. Uh, yes, there was a solid structured craft there uh, with speeds and manoeuvres uh, way ahead of the F-16s. Um, and as a, a sort of unofficial aside, there was a kind of jokey comment um, going around certainly the, the Belgian air staff, which was uh, to the uh, effect of, well, thank goodness they were friendly. There was, a, there was a huge gash in the land where, where something had crashed and it, it, it didn't break anything. You know, you know, I don't know if you've ever been to a crash site where you, know, you had you know, trees you know, just broken like, like in half. Everything was burned and it was like, like if you had almost cut like a, a warm butter with a knife.